strolling along London's Strand can be an evocative experience. Lively theatres, aromatic coffee shops, world-famous hotels and well-established banks are dotted along this iconic route that connects Trafalgar Square and Temple Bar. But what was it like to experience it all in the 18th century? Once described as the most interesting street in the world, the Strand was the site of a special celebration on the 7th of July, 1713. The world sighed in relief when European diplomats signed the Treaty of Utrecht, ending the war of Spanish succession. After 12 years of global conflict sparked by dynastic, commercial and colonial disputes, the European powers proclaimed the long-awaited peace. To celebrate this momentous occasion, Queen Anne hosted a national thanksgiving service at St Paul's Cathedral in London. The event involved a grand procession along the Strand, accompanied by music, a dazzling firework display and a maypole used afterwards by Isaac Newton to mount the largest telescope in Europe. Imagine for a moment you are the engraver George Virtue and the Lord Mayor of London asks you to provide a visual record of the event. Where do you begin? Your journey could start along the north side of the Strand. You take your sketchbook, position yourself by the Savoy and start observing. The first building that catches your eye is the Exeter Change, with its unusual facade jutting out into the roadway. This was a popular site for leisure, where you could buy anything from walking sticks to corkscrews, umbrellas, suitcases, saddles and combs. The 18th century was the age of terraced, gabled houses, and those on the Strand were often described as lofty and well-built and inhabited by the gentry. They also turned out to be an ideal spot to enjoy the festivities, as one newspaper advertised. There is an empty house to be let for gentlemen and ladies with a first, second and third floor to see the Queen go to St Paul's. The excitement started to show in the early hours of the morning when the bustling crowds began to line up the streets. The entrance to Catherine Street appears to have been the only break in the long line of curious heads marvelling at the show. Their cheerful enthusiasm could hardly be contained by the infantry troops in red uniforms shouldering their weapons. What was the attraction of the day? At 11 o'clock, 200 members of both houses, all dressed in ceremonial robes, left Parliament and paraded in their ornate, pastel-coloured, horse-drawn carriages. As the most popular carriage manual in Regency England reveals, their elegance lies principally in their carved gilt ornaments, the coat of arms, the rich paintings, and the insides lined with velvet. The choice of colour depends entirely on fancy, but reds, yellows and whites should be preferred. At a speed of under four miles per hour, this journey took three hours to complete, plenty of time to engage in a game of looking and being looked at and travelling in a state carriage was certainly a feast for the eyes. When reaching the Strand, the members of Parliament were greeted by 4,000 identically dressed charity children from various blue-coat schools. Placed upon a 200 metre long structure built for this occasion, they occupied eight rows, one above the other. Wearing their coats, caps, bonnets and badges from their benefactors, all blue, as this was traditionally the colour of charity, the girls were invited to sit on the left and the boys on the right. 
The system of charity schools was inaugurated during the reign of Queen Anne, an age of benevolence. As part of this education system, which uncovered deep inequalities in society, it was not uncommon to see pupils from charity schools publicly on display on the occasion of the parish's charity sermon for the purpose of raising money. In those days, schools had trustees who sponsored and prepared them for future roles such as apprentices or servants. The children took part in manufacturing schemes, learning to make stockings and prepare cotton, and were encouraged to sing during Sunday service. For the peace procession, they sang two hymns written specifically for the occasion. The first one for Queen Anne as she passed along the church, and the second one, Glory to God, three hours later as she returned. What a bitter disappointment it must have been when the Queen, overcome by fatigue, did not attend the procession as per her physician's advice. But still, the Queen is absent. That's the grief, lamented one poet. Despite her absence, the monarch chose to get involved in all the preparations leading up to the big day. As head of the church, the Queen chose the anthems, commissioned the music, discussed the choice of biblical texts for the sermon, and approved the order of the service. Even the seating arrangement in the cathedral was configured as if she had been there. George Virtue came up with an ingenious solution to introduce her as a virtual participant in the event. On top of the image, pinned on the dark velvet floating curtain, are two roundels. Taken from a silver medal designed by John Crocker, one depicts Queen Anne in profile, and the other is struck with a personification of Britannia holding an olive branch with a Latin inscription taken from a celebratory poem by Horace. Just as the ancient Roman emperors were revered for securing the peace, so was Queen Anne. This 18th century panoramic view is a window into a well-orchestrated display of splendour and an invitation for us to continue the rest of the procession. Imagine how you would picture the journey as you step inside St. Paul's Cathedral while listening to Handel's Utrecht Te Deum. Your carriage awaits. <laughs>